राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो आई बिलीव दिस इज द प्लेस राइट एल एन लार्सन और या आई थिंक दिस इज द वन राइट यस सो प्रभुपाद वाइल एट द बटलर पेंसिल्वेनिया he had uh, several uh, um, he had what do you call uh, um, house visits open house right here open house i don't know if it's ymc or at their home uh, many people used to come and uh, mr larson a professor from uh, uh, slippery rock state college he heard about prabhupath he read at the newspaper he called him <clears throat> he came actually to pick okay i'll be i'll read it from here alan larson i called the number given in the newspaper article but it returned out it turned out that the swami ji was actually staying in the in a ymc room at ymca huh? uh when I, when i arrived he was waiting on the street corner and i picked him up he seemed very much alone when we were driving to slippery rock i asked him to pronounce his name for me so i would have it right when i introduced him to my class he said swami ji bhakti vedanta and then he proceeded to tell me that what that meant since i was not used to indian names he had to repeat it several times before i got it right he showed no impatience with my slowness even at this early junction of our association i was convinced that this man had an inner stability and strength that would be very difficult to shake and this initial impression was further reinforced throughout the rather busy day a hundred students from several classes had gathered to hear the lecture as prabhupada in his natural unrehearsed manner walked down the aisle up the three wooden steps and onto the plain wooden stage he sat down erect and cross legged and began softly singing hare krishna his eyes closed then his students spoke without a uh, lectern or microphone and answered questions from the audience the program lasted only 50 minutes and ended abruptly with a bell signal signaling the next class alan larson after the first class i had a short conversation with the swami ji while sitting outside on a bench on the campus lawn most of the time when he was not directly engaged in conversation he would repeat a short prayer while moving prayer beads through his fingers he was sitting up cross legged and we were speaking back and forth he said that the trees around us were beautiful and he asked what kind of trees are these i replied they are shade trees <coughs> then he said that it was it was too bad there weren't fruits or nut trees to provide food and benefit people at 1 o'clock prabhupad lectured again afterward he accompanied dr mohan sharma a member of the faculty who had attended the lecture and his 16 year old daughter mini to dr sharma's campus residence prabhupada accepted warm milk and dried fruit and at dr sharma's request blessed his home and touched the forehead of his daughter in a gesture of benediction around 3 o'clock professor larson drove him back to butler so this is the <clears throat> his time it's amazing that at least uh, you know if you see india how much he has to push people to do a small program no one was interesting and now in america at least they are inquisitive to see what is this they are very curious i can see mr larson invited him <clears throat> and made him comfortable and uh, seems like approximately 100 student attended to here and proper begins with uh, you know singing hari krishna i'm sure those who heard the 100% they got benefit 
so he also met uh, Mr. Sharma, Dr. Sharma, who's, who's I think daughter also uh, attended the lecture, right? No, who also attended the lecture. And he blessed his house and uh, daughter. But here, one thing I wanted to say here that um, when he, he when he paid attention to the trees, he asked, "What kind of trees are?" So he said that uh, Larsen says it's a, it's a shade tree. So for in Vedic culture, you know, why shade? Why don't we have we don't have a fruit? Tree? At least we give the shade and we give the fruit as well. So it'll there won't be no one will be hungry. But in America, we don't find it. But at least that time itself, he commented on that food and benefit the people. Um, then return back uh, um, to Gaurav, you want to hear? Read. Alan Larson, the Swamiji seemed to present himself as an Indian scholar who had come for a short time to do translation work. I never thought of him as a missionary. But during the course of the day, there grew in me a warm affection for this man, because he was unmistakab unmistakably a good man who had found his way to a stability and peace that is very rare. <clears throat> that lectures, the lectures in Pennsylvania gave Prabhupada his first readings of how his message would be received in America. At Commonwealth Pier in Boston, he had stated in his poem, I'm sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. Now, this principle was actually being tested in the field. Would they, would they be able to understand? Were they interested? Would they surrender? October 15th, Srila Prabhupada received a letter from Sumati Moraji in Bombay. Pujya Swami, I am in due receipt of your letter dated the 24th Ultima. And glad to know that you have safely reached the USA after suffering from seasickness. I thank you for your greetings and blessings. I know by now you must have recovered fully from the sickness and must be keeping in good health. I was delighted to read that you have started your activities in the States and have already delivered some lectures. I pray to Bal Krishna, Lord Bal Krishna, to give you enough strength to enable you to carry the message of Sri Bhagavatam. I feel that you should stay there until you are fully recover from your illness and return only after you have completed your mission. Here, everything is normal with respect. Yours sincerely, Sumati Maharaji. So Alan Larson describes Prabhupada that he see, thinks that he came as a scholar to just finish his um, translation work. But when he met him, he saw that he had, Prabhupada had something special that, not, that many people don't have which was um, having stability and peace, which he said was very rare. And the lectures that Prabhupada gave in Pennsylvania was giving the first message of how his message would be spread towards America. Questions were, would people um, believe, would they understand, or if they were interested? And on October 15th, Srila Prabhupada received a letter from Sumati Maharaji from Bombay. And she said that she was glad to receive his letter and that she was glad that he had safely reached the U.S. And she prayed to ba Lord Balakrishna to give him strength and that he should only return to India after he is fully recovered and after he has completed his mission. After at this time, no one is sure about what is full plans and all, um, nothing. So interesting. Everybody <laughs> thinks he's come for a short time. Uh, very interesting. Okay. Um, Nepa, you can read. Can you read? Are you ready? Yes. Uh, yeah. Prabhupada regarded the last line of this letter as especially significant. His well-wisher was urging him to stay in America until he had completed his mission. He had told the immigration officials in New York that he would be staying in America for two months. I have one month sponsorship in Butler, he thought, and then I have no supper. So perhaps I can stay another month. So he, ha so he had said two months. Sumati Moraji, however, were urging him to stay on. He saw that the prospects for preachings to Americans were good, but he felt he would need support from India. At any rate, he spent long enough 
in Butler and he now had one month left in America. So he decided to go to New York City and try to preach there before this time was up. But first he wanted to visit Philadelphia where he had arranged a meeting with a Sanskrit professor, Dr. Norman Brown at the University of Pennsylvania. Mrs. Agarwal was sorry to see him go. Sally, after a month, I really loved the Swami. Swami, I felt protective in a way and he wanted to go to Philadelphia, but I couldn't imagine. I told him I could not imagine him going to Philadelphia for two days. He was going to speak there and then go to New York, but he knew no one in New York. If the thing didn't pan out in Philadelphia, he was just going to go to New York. And then there was no one. I just couldn't imagine. It made me sick. I remember the night he was leaving, about two in the morning. I remember sitting there as long as he could wait before Gopal took him to Pittsburgh to get on that bus. Gopal got a handful of change and I remember telling him how to pull the money in the slot so that he could take a bath at the bus station because he was supposed to take a bath few times a day. And Gopal told him how to do that and told him about the automats in the New York. He told him that he could eat and what he couldn't eat. And he gave him these coins in a sock and that's all he left us with. So here, um, it's a saying that how uh, uh, Prabhupada, uh, do, uh, regard, he was saying he was going to go to Actually, one paragraph above, right? Uh, yeah, he he regarded the last line uh, urging him to stay in America uh, to complete his mission. The immigration officials was, uh, had given him two months, but he had one month sponsorship and then he had no support for another month. Uh, Stormati Maharaji, however, uh, urged him to stay on, to continue to stay and continue to preach the Americans for good. Uh, but he felt he would need support from India. And uh, uh, at, he had spent long enough time in Butler, so he decided to preach uh, in New York City. But uh, first he wanted to visit Philadelphia, uh, where he had arranged a meeting with the Sanskrit professor, Dr. Norman uh, from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, because to see him going, Mrs. Agarwal felt very sorry. and. Uh, she also said that she loved Swamiji and I, he could, she could not imagine him going away uh, for even two days. Uh, he was going to, uh, he was also planning to go to New York, but he knew no one in New York. Uh, if things did not work out well in Philadelphia, he was just going to go to New York and uh, it made Sally really sick about it. Uh, he, she remembers the night when he was leaving and uh, as she sat as long as he could wait before uh, Gopal took him to the bus station and also gave some coins and a sock for him to uh, use the automatic machines for the bath as Swamiji required to bath a few times in a day. And uh, that is what he was left. Uh, he left the Agarwal place. Uh, and then, yeah. Yeah, we did a very good job. Thank you. It's an amazing uh, decision and determination. Nothing, he just left. That's, um, that's, uh, Vijay and Prabhu, please do it. As a sannyasi, Srila Prabhupada was used to picking up and leaving one place for another. As a mendicant preacher, he had no remorse about leaving behind the quiet life of Butler YMCA. And he had no attachment for the domestic habitat where he would cook and talk with Sally Agarwal about vacuum cleaners, frozen foods, and American ways. But why had he gone to Butler? And was and why was he going to New York? He saw it as Krishna's grace. As a pure devotee of Krishna, he wanted to be an instrument for distributing Krishna consciousness. He stayed Butler had been helpful. He had gotten first-hand experience of American life and he, had, he gained confidence that his health was strong and his message communicable. He was glad to see that America had the necessary ingredients for his Indian vegetarian diet and that the people could understand his English. He had learned that casual one-time lectures here 
and there were of limited value and that although there could be opposition from the established religions people individually were very much interested in what he had to say on october 18 he left butler via philadelphia for new york city so um these passages describe like uh, how uh, like what kind of uh, um, uh, how he was feeling when crowper uh, uh, was leaving butler to new york uh, like prabhupada uh, as a sanyasi he he was uh, uh, used to uh, you know move from one place to another and since he is a preacher and uh, uh, he do not uh, like uh, worry or do not feel regret for leaving uh, the butler omc and also he do not have any domestic uh, uh, like uh, habitat attachment uh, so what are the stops he saw uh, at the agarwal's place and uh, he like uh, if if he was thinking like why he went to butler and why he is going to new york and he 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 he, he just uh, like uh, reflected himself like uh, he thought everything is uh, only to 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 be at, as an instrument for distributing krishna consciousness but uh, his experience at the butler for this these days was like uh, very helpful for him uh, here like uh, uh, it, it, butler was like a first testing ground like uh, to uh, of his uh, preaching and the activities that he has planned to perform in america so here he had got like uh, you know uh, first hand experience and of the american life and as well as uh, uh, he he also had the worry of, about his health but he he got that confident that his health is uh, like in a good condition uh, and also uh, he also uh, got to know like uh, about his diet as well because uh, he when he was starting the travel he these things are like uh, gray areas for him he did not have like any clear idea like uh, how his health will be and what kind of diet he will get there and whether people will be able to understand or not uh, so those lot of uh, uh, basic questions were there so, due to the foreign country but all this uh, uh, questions uh, uh, got clear to him and he was become very comfortable and he was like uh, uh, very uh, like uh, happy and moving towards the new york city wonderful on october 18 he left for left butler by philadelphia such a great i wonder how he carried his books you know that's a, that's a amazing thing anyway so with this we finish once chapter 13 which is uh, you know uh, what is that butler butler pennsylvania anyone remember the title the first testing ground so propath made himself a little comfortable he learned the culture he become a little confident that people can understand now krishna is kind he gives the opportunity um, that he can stay a little longer uh, and plan and now he said let me use this why, why would i sit here in one place let me use this time to preach in new york <laughs> okay let's see. completely depending on krishna actually so we'll begin next chapter chapter 14 struggling alone wow this is a i used to sit in the back and listen to his messages meeting silently he was speaking all impersonal nonsense and i kept my silent i kept my silence then one day he asked if i would like to speak and i spoke about krishna if i would like to speak and i spoke about krishna consciousness i challenge that he was speaking manufactured philosophy and all nonsense from sankracharya he tried to back out and said he was not speaking sankracharya was speaking i said you are representing him that is the same thing he then said to me swami ji i like you very much but you cannot speak here but although our philosophies differed and would not and he would not let me speak he was kind and i was nice to him so he is ex- sharing his experiences again brothers book please read proji propad knew no one in new york city but he had a contact dr ram murthy mishra he had written dr mishra from butler enclosing the letter of introduction parmananda mehra and had had given him in bombay 
he had also phoned dr mishra who welcomed prabhupad to join him in new york at the port authority bus terminal a student of dr mishra's met him as he arrived from philadelphia and escorted him directly to an indian festival in the city there prabhupad met dr mishra as well as ravi shankar and his brother the dancer uday shankar prabhupad then accompanied dr mishra to his apartment at 33 riverside drive beside the hudson river the apartment the apartment was on the 14th floor and had large windows overlooking the river dr mishra gave prabhupad a room to himself dr mishra was a dramatic showy personality given to flashing glances and making expressive gestures with his hands he regularly used words like lovely and beautiful presenting an artfully polished image of what a guru should be he was what some new yorkers referred to as an uptown swami before coming to america dr mishra had been a sanskrit scholar and a guru as well as a doctor he had written a number of books such as the textbook of yoga psychology and self analysis and self knowledge a work based on the teachings of the monistic philosopher shankara after he came to the united states he continued with his medical profession but as he began taking the disciples he gradually dropped his practice although sanyasi he did not wear the traditional saffron dhoti and kurta but instead wore tailored nehru jackets and white slacks his complexion was dark whereas prabhupad was golden prabhupad's was golden and he had thick black hair at 44 he was young enough to be prabhupad's son dr mishra had been suffering from bad health when shila prabhupad came into his life and prabhupad's arrival prabhupad's arrival seemed the perfect medicine so here we can see how prabhupad came to the new york city and he has only contact of dr ramurthy because there was a letter enclosed you know where parmanand mehra had introduced him and now it is explained that how prabhupad met dr mishra at the port authority bus terminal and he also met two personalities ravi shankar and his brother uday shankar and then he got a uh, dr mishra gave him a room river facing with large windows and a description of dr mishra's personality is also mentioned here that he was more of into uh, the expressive gestures and using the words lovely and beautiful and before coming to america dr mishra was a sanskrit scholar guru and doctor and he has written books and as we as he started getting students as disciples and he became guru he dropped the you know idea he dropped his profession of doctor one thing i remember personally that uh, dr mishra later on started in upstate new york he started this ashram called anand ashram which is still there and he later on became known as brahmanand saraswati and uh, many of the sanyasis of scon temples they have gone there and done lot of kirtan in anand ashram so that was one thing which i remembered from dr mishra the same per- this is the same in brahmanand saraswati he came to be known as like so it's we can see how prabhupad's arrival in the life of dr mishra made his life more you know proper he was suffering health problems and later on he also became a sanyasi uh, he became so famous you know that he had his own ashram so yes that's prabhupad's pure devotee's that... grace yeah right very nice i think that part will come later in, i believe because in the introduction pope says that you know he didn't let me preach something yeah, that will come come that will come now yes thank you so swati mata ji you please read
Ramamurti Mishra, His Holiness Prabhupada Bhakti Vedanta Goswami really knocked me down with love. He was really an incarnation of love. My body has become a skeleton and he really brought me back to life. His cooking and especially he, his love and his devotion to Lord Krishna. I was very lazy in the matter of cooking, but he would get up and have ready. Dr. Mishra appreciated that Prabhupada cooking with the uh, precision, precision of a chemist would prepare many dishes and that he had a gusto of eating. Ramamurti Mishra. It was not, Ramamurti Mishra. It was not bread he gave me. He gave me prasadam. This was life and he saved my life. At that time, I was not sure I would leave, but his habit to eat on time, whether I was hungry or not, that I very much liked. He get up and say, all right, this is Bhagavad, Bhagavad Prasadam. And I would say, all right. John Sewell, an old student of Dr. Mishra, often saw Srila Prabhupada and her teacher together at the Riverside Drive apartment. John Shuel, I have a memory of Swamiji as a child in the sense of his being very innocent, a very simple person, a very pure. The impression I have from Dr. Mishra is that he regarded Swamiji as a father figure who was kindly and good. But basically the words most often used referring to Swamiji were like a child, meaning that he was simple in classically beautiful sense. Dr. Mishra mentioned to me when I was first introduced to Swamiji that he was very holy man, very religious, wrapped, wrapped in the God consciousness. Okay, thank you. So basically here Dr. Mishra is sharing his uh, memories, um, Ramurth Mishra, how his, even though he was you know, speaking and successful in one sense, but his life was very miserable, it seems. And Prabhupada's love, uh, cooking and prasadam. Huh? Yeah. So made him transform his life. Uh, you know, may, brought <clears throat> good things within him. He would feed prasadam. So now here, John Sewell also sharing later of... of um, um, her old, you know, initial childhood memories when saw that uh, as a child, um, I have a memory of Swamiji as a child in the sense of being very innocent because he's a pure devotee. Pure devotees are like unusual, they don't see. It's in the cities, people are very much crooked, uh, very much crooked. And, and urban, you know, uh, rural areas, you will find more simplicity. That's the fact, actually. So, and as especially Prabhupada is in all the way from Vrindavan, very simplic simplicity and very pure. Dr. Mishra mentioned to me that I was first introduced to Swamiji when, when I was, that he was a very holy man, very religious, wrapped in God consciousness. That's what Dr. Mishra is mentioning. Um, okay, we, will, we are continuing that reading. Sridhari or Sikar? Swamiji was very sweet. I myself remember him as a very, very good man. Even in the practical details of living in New York, it seemed to involve him very much because he was a practical man and was looking for the best place to begin his work. I remember very well that he was always careful about washing his clothes out every night. I would come in and find a group of students in the living area of Dr. Mishra's apartment and in the bathroom would be hung Swamiji's orange robes. Shri Prabhupada would sometimes discuss with Dr. Mishra the aim of his visit to America, expressing his spiritual master's vision of establishing Krishna consciousness in the West. He requested Dr. Mishra to help him, but Dr. Mishra would always refer to his own teaching work, which kept him very busy and to his plans for leaving the country very soon. After a few weeks, when it became inconvenient to maintain Prabhupada at the apartment, Dr. Mishra shifted him to his Hatha Yoga studio on the fifth floor of 100 West 72nd Street near Central Park. The large studio was located in the center of the building and included an office and an adjoining private room where Prabhupada stayed. It had no windows. 
philosophically at complete odds with Prabhu Pad, Dr. Mishra accepted the absolute truth in the impersonal feature or Brahman to be supreme. Prabhupada stressed the supremacy of the personal feature or Bhagwan, following the Vedic theistic philosophy that the most complete understanding of the absolute truth is personal. The Bhagavad Gita says that the impersonal Brahman is subordinate to Bhagwan and is an emanation from him, just as the sunshine is an emanation from the sun planet. This conclusion had been taught by the leading traditional acharyas of ancient India, such as Ramanuja and Madhva, and Srila Prabhupada was in disciple succession from Madhva. Dr. Mishra, on the other hand, followed Shankara, who taught that impersonal presence of the absolute truth is all in all, and that personality of God is ultimately an illusion. Whereas Prabhupada's theistic philosophy accepted the individual spiritual self as an eternal servant of the supreme spiritual being, Bhagwan, Dr. Mishra viewed Dr. Mishra's view accepted the spiritual self as not an individual, rather his idea was that since each person is identical with God, the Supreme Brahman, there is no need to worship God outside oneself. As Dr. Mishra would put it, everything is one. <laughs> so here we see that Joan Swal, he, he, he saw Shri Prabhupada as a very sweet person. And then he said that he remembered him as a very, very good man. And he also mentions that Srila Prabhupada was a very practical person and was looking for the best place to begin his work. And Srila Prabhupada was also very careful while living in, in Dr. Mishra's apartment. He was very careful about washing his clothes out every every night when he was following all his sannyas etiquettes. I mean, and then and then again here it's mentioned Srila Prabhupada would always discuss with Dr. Mishra about his aim, about his goal of why he came to America. He wanted to start a Krishna conscious movement in the West. And then he also requested Dr. Mishra to help him. But it looks like Dr. Mishra would always refer to his own teachings and then he would always, and he would always keep himself busy. And he never had interest in helping Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and then slowly, slowly, I mean, he, he felt it inconvenient to maintain Srila Prabhupada and he shifted him to a different place, different apartment near Central, Central Park. And then where he was given a small room with no windows at all. <laughs> so philosophically, if you see, Dr. Mishra was like, he was like Mayavad. Whereas Srila Prabhupada, a Vaishnav sannyasi coming in the disciple succession of Madhvacharya, he believed in the personal feature, believed in the personal feature of the Lord. Whereas here the Dr. Mishra was an impersonal. He, he considered the impersonal to be the impersonal feature of the Lord to be the supreme, and whereas the personal feature as illusion. And then here a little bit of philosophy is discussed, <coughs> where Bhagavad Gita also mentions that impersonal Brahman is only subordinate to Bhagavan. And it's just an emanation from him. And then there is an analogy given of a sunshine, which is just emanating from the sun planet. So sun planet is supreme and sunshine is just an emanation from the sun, sun planet. And uh, and like, uh, again, again, there is another example. Uh, like like Vaishnava philosophy, we consider the Jiva to be the servant of the Lord. Whereas Dr. Mishra, who followed the Mayavad philosophy, they, they considered spiritual self as an equal to God. Like everything is fun. So in this way, I mean, they are like complete different odds. I mean, he was like Mayavad and Shil Prabhupada Vaishnava philosophy, and he would not he was not willing to basically help Shil Prabhupada. Prabhupada challenged, if each of if each of us is actually the supreme, then why is the supreme suffering and struggling in the material world? Dr. Mishra would counter that the supreme is only temporarily covered by illusion. And that through Hatha Yoga and meditation, one would become enlightened, understanding. It is all the Supreme. Prabhupada would again challenge, but if the Supreme could be covered by illusion, then illusion would be greater than God, greater than the Supreme. Prabhupada considered Dr. Mishra a Mayavadi because of his inadvert inadvertent acceptance that Maya illusion, that Maya illusion is greater than the absolute truth. For Srila Prabhupada, not only was the impersonal philosophy unpalatable, it was an insult to the personality of Godhead. According to Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 7.24, uh, 9.11, unintelligent men who know me not think that I have assumed this form and personality. Due to their small knowledge, they do not know my higher nature, which is changeless and supreme. Fools deride me when I appear in this human form. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. 
Lord Chaitanya had also strongly refuted the Mayavad philosophy. Everything about the Supreme Personality of Godhead is spiritual, including his body, opulence, and paraphernalia. Mayavad philosophy, however, covers his spiritual opulence and advocates the theory of impersonalism. Prabhu, can you please explain? Yes, yeah, sure, thank you. So basically, this is a, um, a challenge devotees understand very well. Uncompatibility. Uh, a Vaishnava cannot accept the theory of um, 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 impersonalism and Mayavadi theory that you and God, I am God. So he, his point was that, Prabhupada said, you know, um, Jiva is, is, uh, can be, is covered. Uh, so he said that Jiva is covered by the illusory energy, but by the with proper practice of Hatha Yoga, he once he comes out of the covering, he will be supreme. That philosophy. Now Prabhupada said, if in that case, uh, the illusory energy is supreme, because illusory energy is more powerful that it can cover the living entity. That's his argument, Prabhupada. So basically he's taking him in anal analytically, covering his... Uh, uh, false theory that living entity today is not God, tomorrow he can be God with proper practice, denies completely. Who is the Supreme? Um, um, so at this time, he, he does not accept Krishna as the Supreme. Okay, even if we, with your philosophy, if you say uh, that Jiva can be covered by the illusory energy, so illusory energy is the Supreme, then how come the living entity? Right? In that way, we can understand that that philosophy shows that Maya is, is supreme, that's still better than the mass impersonal uh, philosophy. I hope everybody is getting here. So Prabhupada consider uh, it, it, is, it is a very challenge. And pro here he's referring uh, 9.24 and 9.11. What is this that Krishna is saying? Un un those are unintelligent. This is primarily referring to 9. Uh, 7.24, 9.11 and 12.5. Is primarily Krishna is referring that those people who think I'm I don't have a form, okay, I did not have a form. Now I have taken a temporary form. Then I will lose my form. They are very less intelligent. For them, spiritual progress is very very difficult. So in Krishna's words, it's a fool denied me, uh, and Prabhupada because it's a it's an argument. It's a philosophical argument, and we go through actually all this impersonalist we do. And, um, all, and that's what the uh, Vaishnavism is to defeat those concepts and bring them to real Krishna conscious um, platform. Um, that's his position, actually. That's why we offer our prayers. You know, uh, the second prayer, prayer to Prabhupada is that's he, de he descended for this purpose to remove you know, people from this voidism and impersonalism, which is false theory. And establish the real position of Supreme Personality. Got it? Um, um, so, who is the next he is going to read? Cyclone, uh, who you can read? Before coming to America, Srila Prabhupada had written in his Bhagavatam purports The ambitious Mayavadi philosophers desired to merge into the existence of the Lord. This form of mukti, liberation, means denying one's individual existence. In other words, it is a kind of a spiritual suicide. It is absolutely opposed to the philosophy of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga offers immortality to the individual conditioned soul. If one follows the Mayavad philosophy, he misses his opportunity to become immortal after giving up the material body. In the words of Lord Chaitanya, Mayavadi Krishna Aparadi, Mayavadi impersonalists are great offenders unto Lord Krishna. Thus, Lord Chaitanya had concluded that if one even hears the commentary of Shankara, one's entire spiritual life is spoiled. Dr. Mishra was content to align himself with the policy, with the philosophy of Shankara and allow Prabhupada to stay with Lord Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. But Srila Prabhupada pointed out that even Shankara accepted that the personality of God at Krishna or Narayana exist eternally beyond the material world. Therefore, he is a transcendental person, Narayana Paravyaktat. A mencident Prabhupada was temporarily dependent on the goodwill of his 
Mayavadi acquaintance with whom he regularly ate and conversed and from whom he accepted shelter. But what a great inconvenience it was. He had come to America to speak purely and boldly about Krishna, but he was being restricted. In Butler, he had been confined by his host, middle-class sensibilities, and now he was sil silenced in a different way. He was treated with kindness, but he was considered a threat. Dr. Mishra could not allow his students to hear the exclusive praise of Lord Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So here, um, basically, um, Prabhupada um, rejects the um, Mayavad philosophy because Maya, the Mayavad philosophy, liberation meaning uh, being one with God, which is, um, which is kind of a spiritual suicide because there is no identity for the uh, individual conditioned soul. Whereas in Bhakti Yoga, the individual conditioned soul is immortal and his whole purpose is to um, provide a devotional service to the Supreme Lord. And um, even uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, says that uh, Mayavadi impersonalists are great offenders um, onto Lord Krishna. Um, and um, he also, it's also mentioned in Chaitanya, Chaitamrita that if one um, here's the commentary of Shankaracharya. Uh, his entire spiritual life is spoiled. Um, and um, so Dr. Mishra, um, so he did not allow Prabhupada uh, to, um, to speak to his students. Um, like he just, he was content with uh, Prabhupada um, staying with Lord Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita, but he did not, and he staying with the uh, Shankara philosophy. Um, but he did not um, want Prabhupada to preach to his students or talk to his students. So he was confined. And then um, even though Srila Prabhupada uh, said that Shankaracharya himself uh, has, ex has uh, accepted Narayana as the Supreme Personality of Godhead in beyond the material world, in the spiritual world. Um, and um, even though um, there was goodwill from um, from um, from Dr. Mishra, uh, Prabhupada was uh, actually in a lot of inconvenience because he was not able to openly preach about Krishna consciousness. Um, in particular, he was um, confined there because of the host, uh, like their, mid their middle class teacher, but now he was silenced in a different way. Yeah, he was treated well, um, but he was considered a threat by Dr. Mishra. Spending most of his time in his new room, Srila Prabhupada kept at his type, typing and translating. But when Dr. Mishra held his yoga classes, Prabhupada would sometimes come out and lead a kirtana or lecture. Robert Nelson, one of Prabhupada's first young sympathizers in New York, I went to Dr. Mishra's service and Dr. Mishra talked. Swamiji was sitting on a bench and then all of a sudden Dr. Mishra stops the service and he gets a big smile and says, Swamiji will sing us a song. I think Dr. Mishra would not let him speak. Somebody told me and Dr. Mishra did not want him to preach. Every morning, several hours before dawn, Prabhupada would rise, take his bath, chant Hare Krishna on his beads and work at his translating. While outside his closed in windowless chamber, dawn came and the city awoke. He had no stove, so daily he had to walk the seven blocks to the riverside drive apartment to cook. It would be late morning when he would come out onto the busy street. He would walk north on Columbus Avenue amid the steady flow of pedestrians, pausing at each intersection in the sweeping breeze from the river. Instead of the small town scenery of Butler, he passed through the rows of 30-story office buildings on Columbus Avenue. At street level were shoe repair shops, candy stores, laundries, and continental restaurants. The upper stories held the professional suits of doctors, dentists, and lawyers. At 75th Street, he would turn west and walk through a neighborhood of brownstone apartments and then across Amsterdam to Broadway with its center island park. The greenery here would more accurately be described as blackery. 
since it was covered with soot and city grime. Broadway displayed its produce shops and butcher shops with their stands extending onto the sidewalk. And old men sat on benches in the thin strip of park between the northbound and southbound traffic. The last block on 75th before Riverside Drive held high-rise apartment buildings with doormen standing. 33 Riverside Drive also had a doorman. Actually, can you? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, Prabhupada, um, <laughs> I hope everybody getting the scene. Uh, whenever he, he would, you know, give lead kirtan, but sometimes even he starts speaking him, and uh, Mr. Doctor Mister would come and interrupt. Is that Prabhupada is going to lead a sing, sing a song to us? He doesn't want to give have him speak you know, because if he speaks, Mishra will lose all his students. <laughs> so you know it's natural. You know he he has his own uh, ambitions. So now here uh, here every morning several hours before dawn, Prabhupada would rise. He get up in the schedule has been given. Uh, chant work translating. Um, uh, his closed in windows chamber down, you know, how it was difficult for him. He had no stove. So daily he had to walk the seven blocks river apartment to cook. Um, you know, that's the very, very different situation. And he mentions about the, all the crowded um, place, you know, the description of this place of the Broadway. Broadway displayed its produce shops, butcher shops, with their, um, stands extending all these things. So the last block on 70, 75th block Riverside held high risk apartment buildings with doorman standing. 33 Riverside Drive also had a doorman. AJ, you're there? AJ had to drop actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, Pranath, Prasant, you can read. Sometimes Prabhupada would walk in Riverside Park, still careful for the condition of his heart. He liked the long stretches of flat walking area. Sometimes he would walk from Dr. Mishra's studio down 72nd Street to Amsterdam Avenue to the West End Super, Super 80. There he would buy produce and spices for his cooking. Sometimes he would wander through Manhattan without any fixed direction. And sometimes he would take buses to different areas of the city. On weekends, Prabhupada would accompany Dr. Mishra to his Ananda Ashram, one hour north of the city in Monterey, New York. Joanne Su Suval, who, would, who used to drive them, would overhear their animated conversations in the back seat of her car. Although they spoke in Hindi, she could hear their discussions turn into loud shouting arguments. Afterward, they would again become friends. At Ananda Ashram, Prabhupada would usually hold Kirtana with Dr. Mishra's students joining him in the chanting and even in dancing. Dr. Mishra was particularly fond of Prabhupada's chanting. Ramamurti Mishra, I have never seen or met any devotee who sang so much, and his kirtana was just ambrosial. If, if you pay attention and become relaxed, that voice has very electrical vibrations on your heart. You cannot avoid it. 99% of the students, whether they liked it or not, got up and danced and chanted. And I felt very blessed to meet such a great soul. So Prabhupada was uh, careful about the condition of his heart and uh, he used to keep his uh, walking schedule. Um, so he liked the uh, flat area that uh, provided uh, for good walks. And he used to um, go to different uh, areas. Sometimes uh, he would also take buses. Uh, there is no fixed direction and he would uh, keep his walks. And uh, sometimes he would also on the weekends, he would also go to Anandashram along with the Dr. Mishra. 
and uh, 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 Joan says that uh, sometimes their conversations uh, uh, move towards heated arguments, and uh, but again, uh, towards the end, they become friends. Um, and uh, in Anand Ashram, uh, Prabhupada would do Kirtan, and uh, all, all the students uh, liked his uh, uh, chanting and uh, Kirtan. And Ramurti Mishra particularly says that he has uh, such electrifying uh, voice and uh, it is very relaxing. And uh, everybody, uh, when he does Kirtan, everybody used to get up and dance um, and also chant. And uh, he feels that. Uh, he's. I felt very. He says I felt very blessed to meet such a great soul. Thank you, Pranat. You can read. Harve uh, <clears throat> Cohen, a visitor to Ananda Ashram. Everyone got up early and went to morning meditation. Dr. Mishra was dressed in a golden Indian style jacket and the students were already deeply into it when I entered the room. <coughs> All the cushions were taken, so I picked a spot in the back of the room where I could lean against the wall to facilitate my meditation. Seated at one side was an older Indian man in saffron cloth and wrapped in a pinkish wool blanket. He seemed to be muttering to himself. And I later discovered that he was praying. It was Swami Bhaktivedanta. His forehead was painted with a white V-shaped sign. And his eyes were half shut. He seemed very serene. Harve tried, but he couldn't do the Raja Yoga. He was new to Ananda Ashram and had only come up for a weekend retreat. During his morning meditation, he found himself more attracted to the green mist <coughs> above the lake outside the window than to the circle on the wall he was supposed to be meditating on. <coughs> Harvey, I went to my room. The rain was increasing and beating against the windows. It was peaceful and I was glad to be alone. I read for a while. Suddenly, I sent someone standing in the doorway. Looking up, I saw it was the Swami, was wrapped in his pink blanket like a shawl. Can I come in? He asked. I nodded yes, and he asked if he could sit in the chair in the corner. What are you reading? He smiled. Kafka's diaries? I replied, feeling a little embarrassed. Ha, ah, he said, and I put the book down. He asked, what was I doing at the ashrama, and if I was interested in yoga? What kind of yoga are you studying? I don't know much about it, I answered. But I think I'd like to study Hatha Yoga. This didn't him impress him. There are better things than this, he explained. There are higher, more direct forms of yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the highest. It is the science of devotion to God. <clears throat> So Harvey Cohen visited, you know, Dr. Mishra, and then he was uh, doing some meditation activities there, Hatha Yoga, and uh, Harvey was, uh, you know, picked a spot in the back of the room <clears throat> and did see Srila Prabhupada um, chanting, uh, and uh, with his tilak and eyes half shut. And uh, Harvey tried, but he couldn't do that yoga. And he was new to this ashram. And uh, <coughs> um, he was more interested in the, you know, in the nature around uh, than, than the meditation part. And then when Harvey went into his room to, to read a book, uh, the, the Kafka's diaries, and Prabhupada walked in and was uh, pretty much trying to, to tell him that uh, <clears throat> um, that you know bhakti yoga is the highest, that there are better forms of yoga and, uh, than the hatha yoga and uh, <clears throat> um, that uh, bhakti yoga is the highest, is the highest science of devotion to God. 
It's interesting. Did you, uh, did you see uh, he didn't like Raja Yoga. <laughs> yeah, first thing is. <laughs> but, but he's saying that I got attracted to green mist above the lake outside, then the window. Yeah. Then the then the window, then a circle on the wall. <laughs> outside, the, you know, he, so basically he's, he liked more outside. Nature. Than yeah. A, yeah, than a circle. Yeah. I think that's the way he made a circle looks like. Everyone come and meditate on this. <laughs> yeah. Also, he says he couldn't do it. Not that he didn't want to. He said he couldn't, you know. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. She'll read. Okay. As he spoke, I got the overpowering realization that he was right. He was speaking the truth. A creepy ecstatic sensation came over me that this man was my teacher. His words were so simple and I kept looking at him all weekend. He would sit so calm and dignified with warmth and he asked me to visit him when we got back to the city. Dr. Mishra would give lectures carrying the impersonal interpretation of Bhagavad Gita according to Shankara and Prabhupada. When allowed to speak, would counter them. Once Prabhupada asked Dr. Mishra to help him in spreading Lord Chaitanya's movement, but Dr. Mishra sidestepped Prabhupada by saying that he considered Prabhupada as an incarnation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and therefore not in need of help. Prabhupada replied that since Mishra was also the name of Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya's father, Dr. Mishra should help spread Lord Chaitanya's movement. Srila Prabhupada offered to engage him in checking the Sanskrit to his translations of Srimad Bhagavatam, but Dr. Mishra declined, a decision he later regretted. Harta Lurch, a student at Ananda Ashram, my direct encounter with him was in the kitchen. He was very particular and very de definite that he would only eat what he cooked himself. He would come and say, get me a pot. So when I bought him a pot, he would say, no, bigger. So I bought a bigger pot and he would say, no, smaller. Then he would say, get me potato. So I would bring him a potato. He prepared food very, very quietly. He never spoke very much. He prepared potatoes and then some vegetable and then chapatis. After cooking, he would eat outside. He would usually cook enough to go around for Dr. Mishra and about five or six other people. Every day, he would cook that much when he was there. I learned to make chapatis from him. He usually stayed only for the weekends and then went back to the city. I think he felt that was the, where his main work was to be done. So, um, Shrika, okay. So here uh, it explains the interactions between uh, Prabhupada uh, and uh, Dr. Mishra and also Prabhupada and uh, uh, a student from Ananda Ashram, Harta Large. Um, with uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada asked him for some help, but uh, Mishra declined. Uh, Prabhupada offered him to check the Sanskrit of the translations of the Bhagavatam, but um, he declined. And it also says um, that he regretted that decision later. And um, the other interesting thing that was uh, that I found here was uh, Dr. Mishra called Prabhupada as incarnation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I quite did not understand that Prabhu what that meant. If you want to elaborate on that, <laughs> it is a, it, it's a sarcastic. Oh, okay, okay. Your your international program. Why you need help? Oh, okay. By I yourself. Yeah. Okay, right. and then I think Prabhupada to that replied saying that your name is Mishra and uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's father's name is also Mishra. Then you should uh, help in this movement. Mm. So it was kind of the changes between them. 
and the next was uh, the student um, interactions with the student and um, this was more in the kitchen as it explains here how Prabhupada would um, cook for himself and he would only eat what he cooked and um, he would ask him to get a pot and it's it's just a interaction between them how he was um, he uh, he knew kind of shows that how he was particular about the things that he knew and um, he knew what what to do and what how to get things done that kind of things and yeah uh, and it says that he would cook for at least six other people five to six other people and I believe we we have been seeing that since. Um, you know, even in the other chapters too, that how the prashadam was always enough for a lot of people. Um, and in the weekends, it says here that he would go back to city because he felt like his main work was over there. So Prabhupada would go to the city in the weekends. Cooking was a big aspect, looks like there. You yeah. know, prasadam has been like, uh, from mm -hmm. beginning uh, is impressive. Wow. Yeah. Looks like we have to work on that. So looks like Prabhupada started eating chapatis after he came here in, in the beginning. It was, uh, yeah. he wouldn't, when he was, I think it was when he was little, he would only eat rotis and the the person whom the, the, their parents hired, he would like request Prabhupada so many times to eat try chapatis but he would never do it mm. so it looks like mm. where Prabhupada is, it says that he is making chapatis so mm -hmm. that's <laughs> okay <clears throat> you want to read that was certainly true that was certainly true but what could he do there with no money or something he was thinking of staying for, for only a few weeks and then going back to India. In the meantime, he was working on his Srimad Bhagavatam manuscripts, walking in Manhattan, Manhattan and writing letters. He was studying a new culture, calculating practically and imagining, hopefully, how to introduce Krishna consciousness in the uh, Western world. He expressed his thoughts to Sumati Maharaj. It's like uh, market analysis, right? <laughs> what is the analysis? We, uh, trying to study the environment. You know, Prabhupada just really studied the environment here. So in October 27th, he wrote to Sumati Maharaj. So far as I have studied, the American people are very much eager to learn about the Indian way of spiritual realization. And there are so many so-called yoga ashrams in America. Unfortunately, they are not very much allowed by the government. And it is learned that such yoga ashrams have exploited the innocent people, as has been the case in India also. The only hope is that the spiritual inclined um, and immensely benefit can be done to them if the cult of Simon Bhagavatam is preached. Srila Prabhupada noted that the Americans were also giving a good reception to Indian art and music. Just to see the mode of reception, he attended the performance of a Madrasi dancer, Bala Saraswati. I went to see the dance with a friend. Although for, for the last 40 years, I have never attended such dance ceremonies. The dancer was successful in her uh, demonstration. The music was in Indian classical tune, mostly in Sanskrit language, and the American public appreciated them. So I was encouraged to see the favorable circumstances about my future preaching work. So basically now here Prabhupada is doing an analysis, a study, an environmental study. All the situation, what do the people like? You know, how we can use that as a, um, you know, as a instrument, instrument and take out. So he writes in one sense, I think he's going to write to many of the, his, you know, from Maharaji and many of his God brothers for help, all these things. He understood that people in America has some taste for, um, um, you know, Eastern um, 
you know, philosophy and life and everything. But unfortunately, these yoga teachers are exploiting people and government is not supporting also, but they will support. So he went, a sannyasi should not go to the dance and all these programs actually. But just for the sake of understanding, you know, what is the taste of the people? How do they appreciate to study the environment? He has uh, participated uh, in the dance program. He said the Bhagavatam could also be preached through music and dance, but he had no means to introduce it. The Christian missions, backed by huge resources, were preaching all over the world. So why couldn't the devotees of Krishna combine to preach the Bhagavatam all over the world? He also noted that the Christian missions had not been effective in checking the spread of communism, whereas the Bhagavatam movement could be because of its philosophical scientific approach. He was deliberately planting a seed of inspiration in the mind of the devoted Weldi Sumati Moraji. November 8th, Prabhupada wrote to his god brother, Dirtha Maharaj, who had become the president of the Gaudiya Mutt, to remind him that their spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, had a strong desire to open preaching centers in the Western country. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had several times attempted to do this by sending sannyasis to England and other European countries, but Prabhupada noted without any tangible results. I've come to this country with the same purpose in view. And as far as I can see here in America, there's very good scope for preaching the cult of Lord Chaitanya. Prabhupada pointed out that there were certain Mayavadi groups who had the buildings but were not attracting many followers. He had talked with Swami Nikhilananda of the Ramakrishna mission, who had given the opinion that the Americans were suitable for Bhakti Yoga. I'm here and see a good field for work, but I'm alone without men and money. To start a center here, we must have our own buildings. If the leaders of the Gaudiya Mutt would consider opening their own branch in New York, Srila Prabhupada would be willing to manage it. But without their own house, reported that it could not conduct a mission in the city. Srila Prabhupada wrote that they could, not, they could open centers in many cities throughout the country, if his god brothers would cooperate. He repeatedly made the point that al although other groups did not have the genuine spiritual philosophy of India, they were buying many buildings. The Gaudiya Mutt, however, had nothing. So, Prabhupada explains how the Bhagavatam could also be preached through uh, uh, music and dance, but he didn't want to introduce that yet. And yeah, basically, he's now seeing the potentials of the Americans and doing after the market analysis he did. He said that we need to have our own programs and separate because the, no one is going to help. And I need support. He reached out to Sumat Maharaji and he reached out to uh, God Brother Tirthamar and asking, you know, um, please help me support. So it let it be uh, Chaitanya Mart, Gaudiya Mart. But you open the center, I will be the manager of the center. See, up to coming up to here also, he's still willing to take uh, whatever the position. But Krishna had his own plans. Um, he said that, please open the center. And uh, we, I'll manage, not only that we'll be able to open many centers actually. I see a lot of interest in people and there's no pure uh, bhakti preaching program at all at this time. So it's 8.45. Thank you so much um, for your um, participation. We'll continue tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Shilaprabhupada ki